This is Dr. Raluca Scarlatt, and she is doing nuts and bolts work that needs to be done in the Molten Salt Arena. And I'll hand it over to you. Hi, everyone. Um, my name is Raluca Scarlatt. I'm at the University of Wisconsin. We're between two lakes, and in between these two lakes, we do experimental molten salt work. What you see here is salt melting on graphite surface. So the MSRE reactor had graphite columns that looked like this, and in between the columns, the salt was flowing. And so one of those spare columns was sliced up and coated um, in sort of a plastic material so that you don't get graphite dust on your fingers. And um, so I'm going to pass this around. I do research on molten salt. I think it's really important to work on a source of energy that can be economically competitive with fossil fuel, that is clean and that is scalable quickly so that we can deploy clean and cheap energy broadly on the globe. We work on engineering projects related to FHR, fluoride salt cooled high temperature reactors, so solid fuel salt cooled. And then we also work on the science that supports the development of MSRs. In a liquid fuel reactor, the fuel, so uranium or thorium or other actinite, are dissolved in the salt. So the fuel is dissolved in the salt. In a molten salt cooled reactor, you have the fuel encapsulated in, in microparticles and you use the salt as a coolant. Today I'll give an example from FHR. Here's a core cross-section where you have the salt at the bottom with solid fuel that's being cooled by a fluoride salt. In this case, the fluoride salt is FLIB, so lithium beryllium fluoride. One of its many passive safety features is that in the event of loss of power, you can cool using a natural circulation loop. And so you'll have a heat exchanger that's towards the top of the core and the hot core at the bottom. And so that establishes a natural circulation loops that enables you to use either a water pool or air as the ultimate heat sink to cool the core. With that image in mind of salt circulating on its own, I wanted to show you another picture from our lab. This is a droplet of FLIB. And this is a droplet of Flynac. What you see here is some vigorous mixing. The graphite piece is hot, and this is sitting under a furnace lid that's a little bit colder, so the surface of the salt is radiating out and cooling its surface, and so that makes this recirculation path that you see here. Now, this is accelerated. To, it's two times real time, and now we're cooling um, the whole system, and so you can see the Flynac started to freeze. Uh, by forming crystals, and then you'll see that fly freezes in a different um, manner. And so I, I like this video because it shows a little bit of thermal hydraulics and it shows that natural circulation that we rely on for passive um, decay heat removal. Um, it also shows that the chemistry of the salt is important and will affect the thermal hydraulic phenomenology. So you saw that fly neck formed crystals that then sort of fell towards the bottom, whereas fly froze from the bottom to the top and started to look like a glass. So all of that is related to the chemistry of the salts, which are quite different. And so I want to introduce a new dimension to the salts when we talk about the salts, which is the chemistry and the thermodynamics. Let's take FLIB for example. FLIB is a mixture of two salts, lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride. And this is what we call a phase diagram. So on the x-axis we have composition. So on the right you have only beryllium fluoride, on the left you have only lithium fluoride, and somewhere in the middle is FLIB, namely here. You'll see that the melting point of lithium fluoride is high, and so is that of beryllium, but if you mix them together, you get a lower melting point. So phase diagrams serve the purpose of telling us the melting point. They also serve us the purpose of telling us solubility limits. So what is solubility limit? When we add lithium fluoride to molten beryllium fluoride, lithium fluoride will dissolve and form a homogeneous mixture, a liquid. And at some point, it won't do that anymore. So if you add more lithium fluoride, it'll just stay as crystals at the bottom of your mixture. Just like with sugar and water, you add sugar up to some limit, and at some point you can't add any more sugar, it'll just go to the bottom, or, or salt for that matter. 
And so phase diagrams also tell us solubility limits. So in this case, um, at the temperature of 600 degrees Celsius, the solubility of lithium fluoride and beryllium fluoride is somewhere around 30%. So why is this important? If we work with liquid fuel molten salt reactors, we have uranium and the fission products and pretty much all the periodic table dissolved in the salt. And we need to know where the radioactive isotopes transport. Do they go to a solid phase? Do they go to a gas phase? Do they deposit on the heat exchanger? Do they bubble out into the cover gas? Um, and that's important for the safety case so that we can demonstrate that we can, t we can contain and control all of the radioactive isotopes. And so what we need is a phase diagram that's not binary, but has all of the degrees of freedom of the entire periodic table. That seems more daunting than it actually is, because you can begin to group the elements by their general properties, and then you have categories that behave similarly. What we need to have in order to generate these phase diagrams and these solubility limits are both experimental capabilities so that we can do, do high throughput experimentations over all these degrees of freedom, and also theoretical understandings of what is it that makes one element similar to another in its behavior in the molten salt. And that's the dimension that I'd like to add when we think about molten salt as coolants, their chemistry and their behavior as mixtures, because that's what they are. They're mixtures of various salts. To point this out even further, I have here a scatter plot of various batches of MSRE FLIB that were analyzed after they were manufactured. And you can see that their target composition uh, was around a two to one beryllium ratio. But their actual composition of the as manufactured salt varied quite a bit. The mixture properties vary, the chemistry varies, their thermophysical properties vary with that composition. So it's important to understand that this coolant that we call FLIB is not really one thing, but it's really a range with some degrees of freedom. Phase diagrams are one expression of the thermodynamics of mixtures of molten salts. Another example of thermodynamics is chemical thermodynamics. So you might have seen these plots that give, give us Gibbs free energy versus temperatures for various reactions. So what do these plots tell us? If we have, let's say, chromium metal in our piping. So if you have a pipe that's made out of chromium and the chromium converts to a salt, that salt dissolves in this ionic liquid this, in this sea of ions and your pipe goes away. If chromium reacts to form chromium fluoride, chromium fluoride is soluble in the melt, so it dissolves. So that's one form of corrosion where you're converting your metal into a salt and dissolving it out of the piping. And so instead of having your pipe dissolving, you can have a sacrificial element that can lose electrons instead of your pipe. To protect this chromium, we need to understand what is the Gibbs free energy of reaction of chromium, and is there another reaction that behaves as a sacrificial reaction? Now we have data for pure elements, all of these plots that I show you here, they're data from pure elements, from the metals industry, the alloy industry. But then we ask the question, is this data still valid when we apply it to the molten salt mixture? And the answer is almost, with a correction factor. And that correction factor is called chemical activity. This energy number will give us the, equilib the thermodynamic equilibrium concentration of chromium fluoride. It will tell us what's the equilibrium concentration of chromium fluoride beyond which we won't dissolve any more chromium. This calculation, assuming pure non-mixed components, we get a value of around 0.25 arbitrary units. If instead we make some assumptions about the way the mixtures mix and what goes into what solution, then we find very different answers of, let's say, 0.01 or uh, 0.5. We can be very wrong in our calculations of chemical thermodynamics if we assume that the chemistry of the mixtures is identical to the chemistry of pure components. In other words, we really have to get the data in the salt. We can't rely on data from pure components.
Now, again, we have many, many degrees of freedom. Would take a long time to do all of that experimental work. So we'd like to prioritize it and structure it in a way that makes sense. And so for that, we need theory. Fudge factors that I mentioned, these chemical activity coefficients that correct the behavior of, mix of the components in a mixture versus the components in pure state, they reflect the interaction of species in your melt. If you take FLIB, for example, molten salts are ionic liquids. Ionic liquids are different from molecular liquids. Water is a molecular liquid. You have two hydrogens connected to an oxygen. They stay as a molecule when they're in liquid. An ionic liquid doesn't do that. So if you take lithium fluoride and you melt it, then you end up with lithium plus, so a positive cation and fluorine minus, a negative anion. Those ions float freely and independently in the melt. They don't stay together. So it's an ionic liquid. So that's the simplest model that we start from, that all of the ions are floating freely. However, there are some chemical species that are known to form short range order. They like to form complexes or groups of ions. So instead of having something like beryllium 2 plus, you might have beryllium with four fluorines attached to it and a couple of lithiums in the corner. And that whole big chunk has a, ch has a charge of plus one or plus four or plus three. And that's what floats around. So instead of having individual ions floating around, you have these complex structures that float around as ions. That's not unlike room temperature ionic liquids. Anyway, so these complex ionic structures can form in the melt, and they're the foundation of the behavior of salts in mixtures. Because if we understand what complex ionic structures form, then we can start to predict the interionic potentials, and then we can start to predict from theory the thermophysical properties, the viscosity, the density, the diffusion coefficients that are then used in reactor design and in safety cases. And once we have that prediction capability, then we can start to group elements and say, these elements should behave similarly to these, so let's run first some experiments from the first group, the second group, the third group, inform our models, and so on. This is viscosity versus composition for FLIB. So the more beryllium you add, the more the viscosity goes up. So the question is why? Um, it turns out that beryllium fluoride can form polymeric-like structures when it's in the melt. And so the more beryllium fluoride you have, the more of these polymeric ions that you're forming. So you basically have chains, and that chain has a charge to it, and it floats around. And that gives it high viscosity. So that's an example of how understanding a little bit more about the structure of the melt gives you knowledge about thermophysical properties of the melt. In water, you can measure pH. You have these little strips of paper with different colors. You put it in the water, and it tells you what the pH is. We don't have that in salt. So imagine how challenging it is to do corrosion control or to control the chemistry of the salt when you can't even measure the pH. Let's call it PF, not pH. Um, so we're working on developing those methods and those tools so that we can measure the PF. And then, once we can measure it, then we can survey a lot of ways of controlling the chemistry, a lot of buffers, by using our tool. And we can say, okay, this seems to work. So that's an example of a, a fundamental science question that we're working on that then enables the technology advance. In our group at Wisconsin, we work on both scientific challenges and technical challenges. A couple of other technical challenges that we work on are tritium management. We study tritium in graphite. We study tritium in molten salts. Uh, we also look at freezing and solidification phenomenology. Um, there's lots to be said here. And so in order to do all of this, we need tools. And so some of the tools that we um, are developing in our group are electrochemistry, which is really a broad set of tools that's used in aqueous chemistry and high temperature aqueous chemistry. So translating that body of knowledge to the molten salt world is really important and really powerful. Optical spectroscopy, 
Also thermophysical property measurements, so being able to measure heat capacity, viscosity, melting points, and so on. And then a very important goal of ours is high throughput experimentation. Because here's a picture of one of our glove boxes and uh, a top view of an oven that's cold with a pot of salt. Here the oven is hot and it takes a couple of hours to, to heat up and melt a beaker of salt that's pretty small. And every experiment that we do has to be engineered by our students. There's very little off-the-shelf equipment. One experiment is one day, and with the infinite degrees of freedom that we have in the scientific questions that we ask, in the compositions, it takes a long time to get data. And so a really important goal is to come up with ways of doing high throughput experimentation so that you can run a grid of 10 by 10 maybe droplets of salt and analyze their chemical properties and their thermophysical properties in a high throughput manner. We also work with FLIB and so FLIB has beryllium and beryllium is a respiratory hazard. So we were doing our periodic cleanup. These are two of our students, Francesca Carodi and Will Durden, um, doing our periodic cleanup in the lab. This is our group's website. We have a uh, a tab for beryllium safety where we share our best practices. Um, feel free to contact us if you have better ideas for how we should be doing this. We are not authorities on this manner, but we think it's important to share our experience. We work with um, industrial hygienists that advise us on this topic. I think in order to grow the experimental community, it's important to share these experiences and these lessons. I've also taught a molten salt reactor course last spring. It was the first time I taught this course and I put the lectures that were taped, I put them online and then also the lecture notes and the reading. So if you're interested, go to our website and there's a teaching tab and from there it'll take you to um, the course website and each of these topics will have, if you click on it, you'll see the course notes and some of the lecture videos. Of course, very importantly, none of this can be done without the students. In the three years that I've been at Wisconsin, counting the students that have been in the group and have left, we've been about 30 students. We've seen about 30 students that have worked with the salt in the lab. We put a lot of effort into bringing undergraduate students into our lab to be mentored by graduate students so that we teach about molten salt science and technology, um, not just at the graduate level, but also at the undergraduate level. I hope that we'll continue to, to grow the community uh, of molten salt research. And with that, I'll end here. Thank you, doctor. Thank, Thank you very much.